at the end of both sessions, at the end of both sessions, we will start uh, answering questions and taking uh, tackling the questions one by one. And you don't have any issues, even if we don't get to your question, say that and I would share our contact information. You can always reach out to us anytime with questions or if you want to book a session with us personally, you're welcome to do so. So connecting you with the information you need to thrive in Canada, that is basically the point of this webinar series. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Afuda. I'm a licensed insurance broker living in Ottawa, Canada. And uh, as a licensed insurance broker, I basically am building my uh, financial services business where I help clients maximize the potential of insurance in building wealth and family legacy. And uh, I am also an IT project manager. I work for Fully Managed by Telus as an IT project manager. I'm a big believer in the power of information. And that is why uh, I decided to um, convey this Thriving in Canada webinar series, because I believe if you receive the right information at the right time, then there is no limit to what you can achieve at any point in your life. It's all about getting the right information from the right sources at the right time. So that is basically about me. So today in my presentation, I'll be touching on these five topics. The first one, uh, the pillars of building wealth in Canada. Uh, the second one, what is the role of protection in your financial planning? The third one, what are your tax advantage vehicles to investing in Canada? And then finally, I will talk on how do you get started? And then I have a bonus presentation on anyone who is interested in an alternative uh, career option or side hustle. So first, let's go with um, your pillars of wealth. Basically, when building wealth in Canada, in your journey to building wealth in Canada, it must be built on these three pillars. Number one, savings, and then investments, and then protection. This must form the basis of your wealth building in Canada. Whether uh, it doesn't matter what wealth means to you, if your if your wealth building is not formed on these three bases the potential for losses is very high or the potential that you would not achieve your aim will be very high. And here I talk about what does wealth mean to you? I divide it into before age 65. I use 65 here because that is the average retirement age in Canada. So I divide it to before age 65, what should help wealth mean to you or what does wealth mean to you? It's basically your ability to cover your core expenses your ability to save and your ability to invest towards retirement and still have extra to enjoy the pleasures of life, whatever that might mean to you. It might be traveling, it might be uh, doing other activities, it might be putting your kids in uh, uh, extracurricular activities, whatever other pleasures of life mean to you. Wealth should uh, be able to cover your core expenses you should be able to save, you should be able to invest towards retirement, and you should be able to have enough to enjoy these pleasures of life. So you shouldn't be struggling to meet ends meet every month. And after age 65, what should wealth mean to you? Wealth should basically be your ability to cover your expenses and other pleasures without needing to actively work to earn an income while being assured of leaving a legacy behind for your loved ones. Uh, today, we see many people beyond the age of 65 not working because they like working or because they enjoy their job, but working because they need to work because they are not able to cover poor expenses at that age. So wealth means after the age of 65, you are able to cover your core expenses and enjoy other pleasures without needing to actively work. And you are guaranteed that you'll be leaving a legacy behind for your loved ones whenever uh, death comes knocking at your door. So let's talk about savings first. What is the idea behind saving? The idea behind saving is paying yourself first before you pay everyone else. 
every month your or biweekly your check comes in. You have paid the government first on that check because your taxes have been taken away. You will pay Walmart uh, for your groceries. You will pay Enbridge for your uh, gas or whatever gas provider you, you have. You would pay for your electricity. So you are basically paying everybody. The only way you pay yourself is the money you save. That is why when it comes to saving, it cannot be the last thing you do. Because if you leave, if you leave yourself last, then there might be nothing left for you to have. So saving should come right out of your of your paycheck once you get it. And then whatever else should be split beyond your, it should be split between the other bills you have to pay. So the idea is this, you should have a target for your savings already, even before your paycheck advice, uh, arrives. And your first target for savings should be having enough set aside to cover six months of your core expenses if you have zero income within that period. We live in a society where nobody knows what will happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what's going to happen even in the next hour. So the idea of first target for savings should be enough to cover six months of your core expenses. And what this tells you is that you should know exactly how much you spend on your core expenses every month. Your core expenses being shelter, uh, uh, feed, uh, what insurance payments and uh, uh, um, whatever else you cannot do without every month, right? So you should know exactly how much that is and your first target should be saving enough to cover six months of these expenses. And then once you have uh, met your savings target, your saving alone can never be enough to build wealth. If you Everybody knows how long would it take you to save $200,000 from your paycheck every month? How long will it take you to save uh, $500,000? So your savings alone is not going to be enough when you are building wealth. Savings only form a foundation for building wealth because it's from your savings you then go into the next phase, which is investment. So investment is simply putting your money to work so that it can earn on your behalf. You, you cannot depend alone on the money you are actively earning from the sweat you put in, from the hours you put in. You must set money aside to work on your behalf also. And this is what we call investment. So basically, your idea of investment should include short-term, and short-term investment is two to five years, ideally. Medium-term, five to 10 years. And long-term, 10 years plus, 15 years, 25 years. We must begin to think, uh, as, as new immigrants, sometimes it's difficult for us to really think about investment in the long term. Sometimes we are always pursuing uh, how quickly I can, I can get uh, money, how quickly I can, I can, um, I can realize uh, uh, profit or something like that. But really, we should train ourselves to start having short, medium, and long-term investment. And long-term investment should be, what am I investing in that I, I'm looking for returns in 10 year, in 12 years' time, in 15 years' time, in 25 years' time? Because when it comes to investment, time is your biggest partner when it comes to investing. And investing also includes starting a business, right? The time, the effort, the capital you will take to start a business is also part of investing. Many times, newcomers, new immigrants, we always shy away from starting businesses. You know, it's almost as if uh, we get stuck in, the, in working month to month and paying our bills month to month that we forget that, oh, maybe... I have always had a dream to own my own business. I have always had a dream to start this kind of business. And we put that aside and we continue to work month to month. And before you know it, 10 years have passed, 15 years have passed. We haven't looked at that direction. So investing also includes starting your own business. And to tell you the truth, here in Canada and in the West generally, 
business owners are rewarded more than uh, employees, right? As a business owner, the government rewards you more. The government rewards you more with tax benefits, with tax breaks, with uh, expenses you can write off on your revenue before taxes. The government rewards you more than employees. And finally, uh, the final pillar we're going to talk about is protection. The final pillar we're going to talk about is protection. Now, tragedies such as sickness or death, or death have the capacity. It's echoing here. Tragedies such as sickness or death have the capacity to wipe off your wealth efforts without adequate protection. Think about this. The bank ensures that there are assets in your possession. That means your house, if you're an homeowner, or your car is insured. But who is ensuring that your family's greatest asset, which is you yourself, your spouse, your kids are insured? It is entirely your responsibility. Adequate protection must form a core part of your journey to building wealth. Why do I say this? As you begin to save, as you begin to invest, a simple uh, six months uh, illness where you are unable to actively work, that has the capacity to wipe out your savings. God for nobody prays for sickness, but an ailment such as um, cancer or any kind of uh, the big diseases. These has a capacity to wipe out all your savings also. It has a capacity to make you liquidate all the investments you have. Some of us have seen this happen before in our lives. Some of us have seen it happen to people close to us. But what is the way to protect against this? It's simple, it's protection. And when it comes to protection, and that's just simply insurance. If you have the right insurance in place, you have more confidence to pursue your wealth building activities because you know that if anything happens to me, if I'm unable to work, if I'm not here to cater for my family, or if I'm unable to uh, uh, do certain things, I have this risk covered by the insurance company, right? So, and there are different kinds of risks you can cover. You can cover yourself against um, sickness, uh, you can cover yourself against disability, which is simply inability to work, inability to earn an income. You can cover yourself against death, right? A death in the family. Most households in Canada have to be double income households. It's not like they are double income households. They have to be most households in Canada. Now, imagine a situation where one, uh, one of the income earner is unable to earn it affects the entire capacity of the family to live a good life. But with the adequate insurance in place, you can protect against this. Also, insurance can also be used to ensure that your investments and assets are passed down to your children without being sold off to cover your taxes due upon it. Many people don't realize this, but the reason why it is often said that nobody escaped taxes, even in death, is because according to tax laws in the West, most tax laws in the West, especially here in Canada, when a person passes away, all your taxes are deemed due a day before you pass away. So what this means is that all the investment properties you have, all the investments you have made, all the taxes you have made, uh, you owe the government, the government sees it as you have liquidated all your assets and your taxes are due a day before you pass away. The, let me just use an illustration. For example, you have your primary residence, but then you have three or five other investment properties. And those investment properties have uh, uh, gained a lot of equity over the years. And your, your plan is to pass it on to your children. Now, upon death, those properties are seen as they have been sold off at the current market value and whatever taxes are due on them must be paid before it is passed on to your uh, to your beneficiaries. So without uh, insurance is one of the ways people ensure that the cash to pay off their taxes is, is, uh, is available to their loved ones upon death 
and their properties can be inherited basically tax free. And insurance products such as universal life and old life uh, policies also gives you the ability to have an emergency fund, invest towards your retirement, and even invest towards the retirement of your children uh, with uh, single payments. Now let's quickly go to what are your tax advantage vehicles for investing? Because as we all know, it is not how much you earn that matters. It is how much you get to keep. So what are your tax advantage vehicles for investing here in Canada? The first one is your primary residence, right? The profit on the sale of your primary residence in Canada is tax-free. This means you can buy a house, sell it for a profit and go back to renting and all the money you make on that transaction is essentially tax-free. Also, your primary residence can be passed down to your family after death tax-free. So this is one uh, tax advantage way of, um, of earning money in Canada through primary residence. The second one is business sale income. Every individual in Canada has a lifetime tax-free 800,000 Canadian dollars business sale income gain, which means if you start a business today, and you sell it off and you make a profit, the first $800,000 profit on such transaction is tax-free. So you can start a business, small business today, a restaurant, uh, 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 a gym, or whatever kind of business you're interested in, build it over the years, sell it off for, uh, for example, for a profit of $500,000. You keep that money tax free. You still have three hundred thousand, with which you can still start another business, sell it off, and if for a profit of three hundred thousand, you keep it tax free. So that is why starting a business is also a very great way of uh, of building wealth in Canada. And then we go to uh, tax advantage accounts, such as your tax-free savings account, your TFSA. What is the idea behind your TFSA? The TFSA account is designed to encourage you to save and invest. And for this TFSA account, from the day you land in Canada, from that year, you already have contribution room to your TFSA. So it doesn't matter if you landed as a student, it doesn't matter if you landed uh, uh, as a visitor and then converted to work permit. It doesn't matter if you landed as a PR. It doesn't matter if you landed as a, as a worker. From the day you landed in Canada, you have a contribution room for TFSA. So what is the idea behind this TFSA account? It means all the idea behind this account is not, it's called a tax-free savings account, but it's not just to save money, right? Which is the mistake many people make. All the money you put into this account. So the idea is you deposit money into a TFSA account and then invest through that account. So all the money, all the profits you earn through investing in this account is tax free. You don't pay any taxes on it. And your contribution room for TFSA starts the day you first landed in Canada, regardless of your status at arrival. So, so and the contribution limit for the year 2023. Oh, this should be 2024, actually. The contribution limit for the year 2024, which is the year we are in, is 7,000 Canadian dollars. And for the year, for last year, it was 6,500 Canadian dollars. And this contribution limit keeps rolling over to the next year. So if you don't use it, you don't lose it. It keeps rolling over, which means, let's look at this scenario. If you arrived in Canada in 2015, and you have never opened a TFSA account, you have 64,500 Canadian dollars contribution room in your TFSA account that you can actually deposit in your TFSA account. Now, let's assume you invest the full amount, which is 64,500 in a segregated fund, and you earn 7% interest per year over the next 10 years. At the end of 10 years, you would have 126,881 Canadian dollars, which means you would have earned 62,381 Canadian dollars 
absolutely tax-free. Now, if you had invested the same money in with a regular account, like uh, a check, you just open a regular mutual fund account with your bank, this $62,381 uh, you would be paying capital gains taxes on it, which would then depend on how much income you have earned over the last 10 years. So you see, it makes sense to use your tax advantage vehicles to grow your investment first before you start looking at uh, those vehicles that are not tax advantage. Because instead of actually earning $62,381, dollars here, you could be earning less than uh, maybe even 50% of this because the others will go to taxes. Now, the next tax advantage account is your registered retirement savings plan. Again, it's called a savings plan, but the idea of this account is not just to put money in it, it's to invest the money you put in it. The RSV account is designed to encourage you to save and invest towards your retirement. The yearly contribution is indicated on your tax return for each year, which is usually around 13% of your previous year's earned income, but there is a cap on it. The cap is about 31,000 something. The money you put into this account is tax deductible, which means you get refunded the taxes already paid on the money. Like if you're a salary earner, you're your, the money that gets deposited into your account is after-tax money, right? Now, if you go ahead and put money into your uh, IRSP account, you can claim the taxes you have already paid on that money back. And the profit earned is tax deferred, which means you don't pay the taxes now. You only pay the taxes when you start withdrawing the money at retirement. And the idea is that at retirement, your income will be lower. Right, so you be essentially paying less taxes. So right now you're you could be in an income bracket of uh, thirty five percent, but then you save and invest through RSP, and then at retirement you are now in an income bracket of twenty percent. So essentially you pay less taxes on that money. So that is the idea behind RSP. So it's not just to save money; it is also to invest that money. And this is where you invest in long-term vehicles because this is for retirement, right? You should be putting it in investment vehicles that have an outlook of 10 plus years, right? Not looking for quick um, yearly profits. Now, we also have the newly announced first home savings account. This one started last year. It is the best and most efficient way to save and invest towards the purchase of your own home as the first time home owner. It combines the tax advantages of a TFSA and an IRS into one. So what it means is that whatever amount you put in an FHSA, you can deduct your taxes from it. It's tax deductible, which means you can claim back your taxes on it. And the interest you earn from investing in this through this account is tax-free. Started in 2023, which is last year, the contribution is 8,000 per year and unused contributions can be carried forward to the next year. There is a clause on that, but that is not important for this discussion. Now let's look at this scenario. You are, you are, you are 25 years old, right? You just started working. So you started saving towards buying your own house. So if you start contributing the maximum amount in your FHSA this year as a 25-year-old and you invest it in a segregated fund and you are averaging 7% per year, in five years, which is year 2028, you would have contributed a total of 40,000 Canadian dollars. That is 8,000 per year. In five years, you would have contributed 40,000 Canadian dollars. Assuming you are at a marginal tax rate of 25%, the total tax refund you would receive in those five years would be $10,000. That means $10,000 is the tax refund you would have received from CRA based on your contribution into your FHSA account. Over those five years would be $10,000. And your total interest earned over that five years at 7% per year will be $9,226 which means that essentially the total amount you have towards purchasing your home would be 
40,000 plus 10,000 received from uh, as uh, tax returns plus your 9,000 interest, it will get you to 67,226. Uh, no, this should be $69,226, right? So basically, you contributed 40000 but at the end of five years, you would have 69000 towards the purchase of your home. So this is why I say it is the most efficient way. Once you have decided you want to own a home in Canada, it makes no sense to be saving towards owning your home in your checking account or your savings account and uh, let go of all these tax advantages. Now let's look at another scenario. Uh, mm -hmm. permanent, permanent life insurance policies such as universal life and whole life insurance also have cash value attached to it. And now what is what does it mean by cash value? One of the biggest, uh, uh, in my discussions with clients, one of the biggest issue with getting life insurance is always, oh, so if I get a life insurance and then I live long, nothing happens to me. It means I would have paid all these monthly uh, premiums. And if nothing happens to me after 25 years or after 30 years, my money is gone. That is usually the uh, biggest problem I find with people when it comes to life insurance. But permanent life insurance basically is uh, what we say, permanent, right? So it's always there. There is no limit to it. So you could live to 120. Your life insurance would always be in place. Now, the cash value attached to these policies, uh, universal life and whole life, are basically bank accounts, right, within your insurance policy, where a portion of your monthly premium goes into for investing in various funds chosen by you or the insurance company, depending on if you are on universal life or whole life. So your money, you pay money monthly to the insurance company, but then they take out of it, put it in a bank, separate account, and then invest it on your behalf into something you have chosen or into something they choose. Now, the growth on this investment is exempted from taxes as long as it remains in that account. So you are investing, you are earning money on your investment, your cash value is growing. You don't pay taxes on that as long as it remains in that account. And you can also access it without paying taxes on it. There are different ways to access it without paying taxes on it, whether immediately or whether later. But that's a discussion for another time. So what's cash value of permanent life insurance policies gives you is that you create another tax advantaged account, investment account with which you can invest in once you have maxed out your, as your, as your uh, income continues to grow, right? Because all of us will always work towards growing our income. We are maxing out our RSP contributions. We are maxing out our TFS contribution because this contributions have limits. You are maxing out uh, your FHSA. You are maxing out all your tax advantage accounts. Instead of then exposing yourself to non-tax advantage investments, having permanent life insurance gives you an option to also have tax advantage investments uh, that you can utilize towards your um, towards your wealth building journey. So basically, with a permanent life insurance policy uh, with cash value, what you get is guaranteed death benefit. That is cash for your loved ones, regardless of the age of death, right? Guaranteed cash payout in case of critical illness or extreme disability. So in case of critical illness such as cancer, kidney failure, liver failure, or extreme disability, where this extreme disability simply means... Uh, uh, when someone has a diagnosis and they say, oh, your life expectancy is now five years or your life expectancy is now 10 years, so, right? So this provides guaranteed cash payouts in that uh, situation. The cash value also serves as an emergency fund because it's basically like a bank account. You can withdraw 
it anytime you are in need of cash. And then uh, the contribution room, it provides contribution for tax sheltered investment for when you have maxed out all other avenues for tax sheltered investing that you have available to you. And then the investment can also be used as part of your retirement plan. So you are not only just paying money to protect yourself and your family, you are also investing towards your retirement planning all with a single uh, monthly payment. Now, all this being said, how do I get started? Like in everything, everything starts with an in-depth financial analysis. So an in-depth financial analysis would provide you with an accurate snapshot of the following. One, what is your income and what are your expenses? That shows you where you are financially, your current financial standing. And it also provides you a very important information, which is your financial independence number, which simply means how much do you need to have in invested? How much does your investment need to be worth at retirement age for you to be able to conveniently retire and still have your monthly uh, expenses covered without needing to work anymore. So this forms your financial independence number. So you know exactly how much am I working towards. And then when I get to this amount, I can conveniently say I, I can retire conveniently. And an in-depth financial analysis also helps you the gap between your current financial standing and your desired financial standing. And then you see, what do I need to get from where I am to where I need to be at retirement? And what do I need to do to get there? And a clear plan to close this gap within the numbers of years you have before retirement. So when you do an in-depth financial analysis, for some people, the results will clearly show you that you need to cut down your expenses. For some people, the results will show you that your expenses, there is no way to cut it down. What you need to do is increase your income. For some people, it will clearly show you that you have been saving and investing in the wrong way. You need to start saving and investing in the right way. For some people, it will show you that you are exposing your savings and investments to, uh, uh, to mishaps, right? You need to have adequate protection in place. So that is what an in-depth financial analysis does for you. And now here's the, the bonus um, 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 the bonus side I spoke about, right? So if any of these statements sound like you, my target is just to make extra 2K income monthly and I should be fine. I want to own my own business. I hate that there is a limit to how much I can earn from my job, regardless of my effort. For, uh, for example, oh, your income can only increase by 3% or 2% every year at your job. I love providing solutions to people's problems. So if any of these sound like you, then uh, you can reach out to me and may have something that will be of interest to you. So these are my details. You can reach out to me by text or by WhatsApp or by phone call. These are my social media handles, my email. Right, and then we can talk some more about uh, what I have and what can be beneficial to you. And thank you for your time. I know I've rushed through it, but I would love to uh, answer all of your questions uh, anytime. So thank you for your time. That's my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Any question? Um any of the topic insurance investment yeah so we have a question in the chat can your employer give adequate retirement plan that is you have employer provided life insurance and retirement benefits so the person andrew is asking if that should be adequate uh, one thing i would say employer provided uh insurance is it's never permanent uh, life insurance. It's always term life insurance, right? And then if you read through the documents, you would see if it's adequate because um, most employer provided insurance, the cap is always on your salary. So it's usually maybe 100% of your yearly salary. That is your insured amount, right? And for the retirement planning, this is the essence of in-depth financial analysis because it takes into consideration 
everything you have in, and then you see if it's enough to get you to where you need to be. Okay, I I'll just add to that, like, um, there's always a cap on the insurance you get from your employer, except the job is yours or it's it belongs to your generation and you're never going to leave that job because you can't take that insurance out when you're leaving, right? And it's usually maybe two times your salary, depends on um your level. So yes. maybe max, they'll give you five times your salary. So take your annual salary and multiply it by two. That is your coverage. And um, it's not something they review. Like every year they increase that. But if they increase your salary, yeah, it goes up. But then think about when you leave the organization. Say you join the organization at 30 and you're living at age 40. You can't take that insurance with you, right? So you have to now go back to an advisor for an insurance. And at that age, your premium is going to be higher. Or maybe any else issues might have come up. So... It's it's never enough to be very honest. We have another question. Uh, the person said yes. if the RRS, RRS is yeah, automatic, automatic okay. upon employment. Some employers provide RSP contribution. It's never um, automatic. You have to say you would like to contribute if it's an employer provided um, a group plan, right? So it's voluntary. You can choose to contribute, but you can also have your own personal RSP account. So it doesn't always have to come through your employer. Some employers provide, some employers don't provide group plans in this case, but you can always have your own personal one to complement whatever your employer has provided. Morning in progress. I just wanted to confirm with the efficacy yes, 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 yes. tax benefits when you file them. Yes. So whatever money each year you're filing your taxes, whatever money you have put in your FHSA and RSP, you have a separate document, you will file it also along with your taxes. So it shows you contributed X amounts to FHSA, you contributed X amount to RSP, you file it with your taxes. And in the end, when you get your tax return, it will be calculated towards your tax returns. So please keep the questions coming. We will start the mortgage presentation right now. And then uh, we will have a question session at the end. We'll answer those questions. And if we run out of time, like I said, you can always book a session with myself and uh, uh, Saida directly to answer all of your questions at your convenience. I will also share my contacts in the in the chat right now. All right. Um, thank you, Dotto. So I will start sharing my screen. Um. <clears throat> Please let me know when you see it. <clears throat> Does, can you see it? Is it? Um... Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, All you right. can see it. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Please, uh, unlike those one, please. I just want I just want it to be more interactive. So please, um, chip in. If you feel that what I'm saying is not right, uh, some people probably have more knowledge than I do in this space. So uh, so just to touch briefly on the real estate market, uh, whatever I present right now, is just going to be like an eye level overview. It's not it's not in depth. Uh, and just like Dustin said, uh, maybe subsequently we kind of like pick the topics one by one and then go through it in depth. Okay. So just allow me to introduce or reintroduce myself for those that doesn't know me. I am Saidat. Uh, I okay. So I'm a business data analyst, uh, financial planner, mortgage agent, and also a vacation consultant. Uh, I have a vast in experience in retail banking industry and um, 
about four years now as a mortgage advisor slash agent in Canada. Uh, so I love talking to people about like, financial plan, financial planning, financial investments, home buying and all of that. Um, so if whether you're a first time home buyer or you're looking to like explore what the opportunities are in the real estate market or I mean, you've been around a few times. Uh, my goal is just to set us up for a successful financial future. So please <laughs> feel free to ask me questions. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about my brokerage because lo a lot of times people ask me, oh, are you Pegasus? I am not Pegasus. Pegasus is my brokerage. And uh, in Canada, by law, you, you cannot act as a mortgage agent standalone. You have to work on that brokerage. So if I have the opportunity of working on your mortgage application, <clears throat> it's going to come through Pegasus. So Pegasus is my brokerage and they're in Ontario, they're in GTA. So you can always feel free to check them out and see what they also offer. And um, what do I do? What do we do? Mortgage solutions, basically. So anything and everything mortgage. Um, purchase, refinancing, talking to different financial institutions, getting the benefits, interest rates, and faster approval, uh, debt consolidation as well. When it comes to refinancing your house, when it comes to home equity line of credit, um, lowering your payments. And also we have the investment solution part of it uh, for people that want to explore investment opportunities in the real estate market. The question that I also get of asked often is, why should I use a brokerage or why can't I use a traditional bank? And um, I always use this as an example. Like if you, if I say I work with TD as um, a mortgage advisor with TD, if you walk into TD or you walk into my shop, I can only offer you what TD has, right? So even if I have a vast knowledge of every other financial institution product, I cannot offer them to you. But with a brokerage is different because we have access to over 40 lenders. And I think the misconception we always have as new immigrants is we always think it's just the brick and mortar bank that I can walk into and get my financial solutions. There are tons of financial institutions that are not even brick and mortar. And you could always get the best rates from them. So that is the advantage of working with a brokerage as, as opposed to working with a, a traditional um, institution. The thing is the brokerage also have access to all the lenders. So either it's your bank, your favorite green color bank, or it's just that bank that you've never heard of. We have access to all the lenders. So um, I kind of put this flow chart because uh, it just kind of like explains what your mortgage process is at a glance. So sometimes um, the truth is being a first time home buyer can be very overwhelming. It is overwhelming, no doubt about it. And sometimes a lot of people are kind of like, where do I start from? Um, and also there are so many information out there. Uh, I always tell people start with your budget and have a budget in mind and don't go over that budget. It's important that you have a budget and it's important that you set that budget. Like this is how much I want to buy regardless of what the market is saying because by the time you start the house showing it's always very enticing you go to one you say oh it doesn't have this kitchen is small i want a bigger kitchen or i want a bigger restroom and then you start okay can i go from 300 to 400 and then you start going on and on and on so have a budget in mind and then the second step is to get pre-approved the whole idea of getting pre-approval is you just kind of let you understand where you stand financially and what you can afford uh, in terms of your affordability. So, um, and a lot of realtors would, they don't, I mean, pre-COVID, you can easily shop around without getting pre-approval. But these days, with a lot of high rates of um, uh, refusal and unable to close, a lot of realtors would ask you to, to get pre-approved. And basically the process of pre-approval is just kind of like we run the numbers and I tell you, oh, that's, so this is how much house you can buy based on the analysis or based on your qualification. 
So when you get pre-approved, then choose a choose a lender and a mortgage. So basically, um, that is where I come in. Uh, because I think a lot of times so people think, oh, can you help me shop for house? So there are two different buckets. So there's a realtor and there's the mortgage broker slash agent. Uh, so I tell people I don't do so the person that goes with you to show you the houses and do the showings, they are the realtors. Uh, I do the finance. So I talk with the lenders on your behalf. So it's going to start with me from process two is getting pre-approval is going to be with me. And then choosing the lender will be based on the interest rates in the market at the time. And your financial situation will determine which lender to go for. And once we have that, then we submit, we package the application. So in three, your realtor will also come in. You can start doing house showings. You can start looking at the houses. Do I want to do a new construction? Do I want to do um, a resale? And then we submit the application. Once it's approved, you sign the document, and then you collect your key, and you start making payments and um, easy peasy. Not that simple, but I mean, that's just the whole process. Um, so I will deep dive in into the type of lenders that we do have. This is another thing that comes up, questions that comes up often, like what is A lender, what is B lender? So basically in the brokerage world, we kind of categorize the lenders into three. So we have the A lenders, uh, we have the B lenders, and we have private lenders. And I'll just run through them because it's important. It usually comes up. So A lenders, will call them also known as prime lenders. So they are very strict on policies on who they lend to. Like just think about when you working with an A lenders, everything has to check out. Check, 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 check. So um, your credit, nothing, they don't want to see any stain on it. So your down payment has to be on point. Little or no exceptions, they don't make room for that. Um, so sometimes when people cannot fall into the bucket of an A lender, then we move them to a B lender. Uh, B lenders are quite, they have relaxed rules when it comes to borrowing. Um, so they are extended to borrowers who don't qualify for A lenders. The plot twist is a lot of A lenders are also B lenders. So you see uh, BMO, for instance, BMO has an A, they have an A lending side and they also have the B lending side. So don't be surprised. Sometimes you give client, they'll be like, oh, is BMO A lender or B lender? Well, they are also A lending side and they have a B lending side. Um, so for B lenders, um. there are a lot of nuances I didn't put in here. The TDS is quite higher. You, um, for B lenders, you have to do 20% down payment. That's the minimum. For A lenders, you can do minimum of 5%. So there are some kind of nuances in there. But for B lenders, it's more about the property. Like, is the property in good shape? You know, they don't want any red flags. Um, instances where people cannot, they do not qualify for B lenders, and it happens a lot more than we think, then we move them to private lenders. So private lenders, they extend the loans to borrowers that do not qualify for or A or B. And um, typically they are made up of individuals and investment corporations. And their focus is basically on equity and subject property. Um, for private lenders, they don't, you, you can get a, um, a mortgage with a private lender with no income. So they don't really like, Go into the nitty gritty of tax. Your income must be this and that, uh, you know. Um, but it's it's expensive, right? Um, the interest rate is higher, and then there are other fees involved that you have to pay. Um, usually when you come for financing, you usually want to start with an A lender, and then we move down the line. So A lender first. If you don't qualify, then we check the B lenders. If you don't qualify, the last resort will be a private lender. Any question? All right, so um, like I said, um, and like Dr. mentioned, um, when it comes to, and I say this often, when it comes to financial, when it comes to financial planning, it's not a one cap fit all situation. So what is applicable to A is not applicable to B. Until, and I say, until I run the numbers, I cannot tell you for sure, this is where you stand. So. Um, but this would just be the general rule. 
the things we look out for when you to get qualified for mortgage will be your employment. You need to have a job. Um, and then your credit history and then your assets, basically. So this just kind of like um do a breakdown of A lenders. So there is GDS, which is the gross debt service ratio. Uh, and then there's TDS, which is the, um the total debt service ratio. And this talks about you must have two years minimal work experience, you are not in probation. Your FICO score, which is your credit score, is above 680. Your down payment should have been in your account for the for first time home buyers. Your down payment should have been in your account for the minimum of 90 days before closing. Uh, you mustn't have filed for bankruptcy. And if you have, you should have been cleared for at least two years before closing. So, like I said earlier, they are very finicky when it comes to all these things. Uh, B lenders, you can see the GDS is quite high here. You can do like 59. Sometimes they lend up to 65% GDS. Um, your credit score, as long as it's above 600, a B lender will take it. Um, down payment should be in your account. And then their consumer proposal should have been cleared um, before one year before closing. For private lenders, ugh, they don't care about your score. So even if your score is 300, they will give you. Uh, GDS, TDS, sometimes they look at it. It also depends on, I mean, what your affordability is. And then employment, not so much. So, so I'll just touch base on the types of mortgages that we do have. So usually purchases, right? So the purchase could be you want to buy a new build or you want to buy an existing property, right? So, um, your purchase could be two types. So your purchase could be conventional or unconventional. Um, so conventional would be when your down payment is 20% and above. That's a convention. So you could hear some people say it's a conventional mortgage. Uh, so if your down payment is below 20%, then we call it insurable mortgage or unconventional mortgage. Uh, so in this case, if your down payment is below 20%, then your amortization, the, the maximum amortization, amortization would mean the maximum number of years you can have the mortgage. So if your down payment is below 20, the maximum amortization is 25 years. Um, and this will be in short. So it goes through CMUC, say Gen, um, Gen what? So those are the insurable, uh, the insurance companies for that. And it's only offered by A lenders. Okay. So for conventional mortgage, uh, so you see LTV. LTV is loan to value ratio. So when you hear someone say LTV, so loan to value ratio means the amount that the bank is going to lend you um, on the mortgage. So if you do 10% down payment, so that means your LTV is 90%. So that means the bank is lending 90%. If you do 5% down payment, that means the bank is lending you 95%. So when you hear all those terminologies, those are what it means. Um, so when your down payment is 20% and above, then you can extend your amortization up to 30 years. I mean, with COVID and inflation, there's been a lot of, um, changes, but these are just basics, right? Um, and this does not require insurance. So we usually will call this an uninsurable mortgage or conventional mortgage and is offered on both A and B sites, right? And then we have the non-conforming. Oh, the non-conforming, I think, will fall into the bracket of private lenders. Hardly would you see an A lender do a non-conforming mortgage. But like I said, it's it's on an individual basis. So until you run the numbers or until the underwriters look at your file, and then they can make a decision based on that. Uh, so usually it's going to be 65% LTV. So that means the bank is going to be doing 65% loan to value, and you'll be doing 35% down payment. So in this case is when your debt ratio are too high, and then sometimes B lenders will be like, increase your down payment before we can borrow you money. Uh, refinance is a very big one too in the mortgage world. Um, refinance usually will be for people that have an existing property and you want to take out money from your existing property. So we call it refinance or you could do sometimes Equity takeout is also an option. So sometimes we hear equity takeout, like, uh, uh, let me paint this scenario. You you bought a house 
right now, say your house is worth 600,000 and your mortgage balance is 400,000. So that means you have 200,000 equity on that house. So you can take out a percentage of that 200,000 on the house, right? So you can take it as an home equity line of credit. You can take it out as a second mortgage, right? So in that case, you do a refinance. Um, so this is also the things in all of these instances, um, the qualifying the qualifying criteria remains the same. Your job, you must have a job, uh, you must have a means of payment, and all of that. The five C's of credit comes into play. Um, so home equity line of credit is a very common one that a lot of people do, especially when their houses have appreciated. So you can purchase it with a refinance, both on A lender or B lender side, or you can do it as a standard one. Um, rental properties, of course, um, for people who buy the first house, the next one is I want to buy a rental property. Um, so for this one, it's usually conventional. Um, it's very in rare instances that you will do a minimum less than 20% down payment for a rental property. If it's a rental property, your minimum down payment has to be 20%. You can extend your amortization up to 30 years and um, it could be with an A lender or a B lender. I, I think the question that usually comes up when people are buying a house would be, oh, should I do 5% down payment? Or should I do 20% down payment? And uh, there's been, um, there are varying uh, opinion to that. My opinion, when I tell people is, I mean, you, you have to do the math, right? And um, if you if you have 20% and you are not constrained, because the question I ask you is when I when I ask my client, I'd be like, oh, I want to do 20%. The first question I ask you is, do you have an emergency fund saved? Because real estate is an asset, but it is not a liquid asset. And what that means is, if you put all your resources in a property, it is not easily realizable. So you can't sell the house the following week. And, you know, so you, if you're tying money down for it, because you're going to be tying that money down for a long period of time, real estate is a long-term investment. So the question is, if there's an emergency at home, you lose your job or there's a medical emergency, do you have anything saved anywhere that you can use? You know, those are the questions you need to ask. But if you have the means, by all means, if you want to buy your house 100%, I mean, go for it. If you want to do 50% down payment, go for it. But there are other methods I always tell people you can use to, rather than do 20%, do the minimum and then use, there's something we call prepayment when you set up a mortgage. So prepayment would allow you to pay down on your principal every year, right? Um, sometimes your prepayments could be as high as 100,000 every year. So that means you can pay down as high as 100000 on your house every year. So I'd rather take that money, invest the money, take the proceed, and use it towards a prepayment towards your house. I mean, it's an investment conversation that I usually would have with clients. So for first-time home buyers, um, it's usually very, like I said, it's usually very overwhelming. And in terms of the documentation you have to submit, in terms of uh, do I qualify or do I not qualify? So I'm just going to talk about there are several programs that are available in Canada for first-time home buyers. So the first one is the IRSP. So you can use your IRSP um, towards your home buyer's plan. If you haven't purchased the house within the last four years or lived in a spouse house, uh, a spouse home in the same time frame. So you can borrow up to 35% from your RRSP to fund your down payment. So without, you know, I think Dr. mentioned RRSP, like you take out the money, you pay taxes on it. And um, there are two instances where if you take out the money from your RRSP, you don't pay the tax. It's when you use it towards your own buyer's plan or use it towards your education, lifelong learning plan. Um, the the bot is that you have to put that money back. So for some people, it doesn't make sense. Like, after all, it's my money. Why do you have to return it, right? Uh, remember that the goal of that money is for your retirement. But then the government allows you to pull it out for, for learning purpose or for home buying purpose. And then they expect that you put it back every month. There, there is a calculation to it. Um, CRA would usually, so when you withdraw money from your RSP, 
and you tell um your advisor like it's for own buyer's plan, you always remember to let them know that it's for own buyer's plan. Otherwise, you're going to be taxed at the federal tax rate. So when you take it out, they, the, um, the financial institution has an obligation to report it to CRA. So when they report it to CRA and then when you file your taxes, CRA is going to put it alongside your um, notice of assessment. And then they will tell you how much you meant you are, you're going to be paying back. I think you have 10 years to pay it back. So it's a long period of time, right? Um, there's land transfer rebate. So um, part of the things down payment that constitutes when you're buying the house, I said your down payment is your closing cost. So you need to have the closing cost. The closing cost varies. There is no set amount. Uh, it could be between 1% to 1.5% to even 3% of the purchase price. So it depends on the province. It depends on the amount and all of that. And the lender. So um, part of your closing cost is your land transfer tax. You have to pay that to the government. Uh, so it's generally between 0.5% and 2% of your purchase price. And it's usually represent the largest cost, closing cost that a borrower would incur when buying a house. So uh, some province would um, give you a rebate. I know for Ontario, Ontario will slash it by half. So let's say your land transfer tax is $8,000. When you're closing your house as a first-time home buyer, you, you're only going to be paying $4,000 to the government. And um, so Ontario, BC, present World Island, even some home buyers in the city of Toronto. So if you're buying a house in the city of Toronto, you will receive a rebate on the land transfer in addition to the provincial rebate. And I think it makes sense because the costs, it's a high cost of buying a house in those provinces. Um, there are no zero down payment programs in Canada. So it's also a question like, you need to come up with a minimum of 5% when you're buying a house minimum and that five percent if you're a first time home buyer your down payment should have been in your account 90 days before closing i always emphasize this because it's one of the things that would that would um not make your financing go through so what that means is let's say this is january you are open to close your house in may right so that means your down payment should have been in your account um uh, march april May. So if you're closing your house end of May, so that means your down payment should have been in your account at least by March, right? So you count 90 days before closing. Uh, okay, so there's also this first time home buyers tax credit. So you get a tax credit. Um, this was introduced in 2009. Uh, so you can recover the cost associated with your purchase. Uh, so usually when you're filing your tax for the year and you're buying now, so let's say you're buying a house this year, uh, when it's time for tax filing next year, remember to talk about it to your accountant or whoever is filing your tax because you're eligible for a non-refundable credit of up to $750. Also, you have the GST and HST new housing rebates. So they offer money back to Canadians who buy a newly built home or you renovate an existing home or you rebuild a home that was destroyed by fire. So in all of these cases, you know, there's going to be a GST and HST. So all of this as well uh, would come in handy when you're filing your taxes for the year. Also, there's a first time um, home buyer incentive plan. Um, there have been different modifications to this plan and it's... um. I didn't put all the information because there is an income qualification criteria to this plan. So you need to qualify for it. Uh, but if you really want to know, you can just, um, I can drop the link in the chat just so you can see if you qualify for the first time home buyer incentive plan. So it was it's offered by the government of Canada and um, you could get up to five to 10% if you're buying a newly constructed home or if you're buying a resale or if you're buying um, a mobile home. Um, so basically how this works is the incentives is a shared equity mortgage. So the government has a shared investment in your home. Like I said, if you are interested, I'll drop the chat. You can read more about it. You can ask your advisor about it if you qualify and uh, it's income based. So they will have to check your income to see if you qualify. 
Okay, so so there are different mortgage programs because I mean there are different people with different residential status. Um, I think we all know by now that foreigners and uh, there's been um. I think 2022, 2021, uh, there is um there's a ban on foreigners are buying house in Canada. So right now you cannot buy a house in Canada if you do not have a resident status. Um so it's not a question. Um, however, um not everybody is a permanent resident. We do have temporary residents and they could be foreign foreign um foreign uh owners, they could be students. Uh, refugee climate, foreign workers, and all of that. Um, so for those kind of people, um, there are different lenders that do different programs for different kind of people. So I just kind of like, this is just like an overview. Um, so your loan to value ratio is going to be 90%. So that means you have to do 10% down payment. If you're looking to buy a house as um, a foreign worker, you must have a legal, a legal status in Canada and you must have a valid work permit for 12 months or more. Uh, your bank statement, three months bank statement, history of funds, wire transfer is accepted. Under this program, um, so like I said, different lenders, some lenders would allow students to buy, some lenders would not allow. So it, it's, 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 it depends on the lender at the time. Uh, for new to Canada, um, so some there are programs um targeted for new to Canada, um, and this is if you've spent. I mean, I did um I had a client who they purchased a pre construction and they were just barely four months in Canada, right? So once you have a job, so they didn't have credit, like no 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 credit is true, right? But they are full time employed and um. They had the down payment. So we just kind of did that verified. And uh, we get they were qualified under the new to Canada uh, program, basically. And then they they got a rate guarantee for one year because it's um it's a new build. So if you're new to Canada and you have the funds, that doesn't stop you from buying. You don't have to wait. If you uh have a full-time job and you have your PR status, then you also can qualify. Um, there are different other programs as well. Um, for I mean, PR is is usually um the common one, but there are other programs. Uh, with Pegasus, okay. So for rental, I also rent out properties, like I said. Um, so I just like a, an FAQ here, like um both A and B lenders would offer rental properties, yeah, but they also have their own set of criteria that must be followed. So um not all lenders offer rental mortgages so when you're looking to buy a rental property and um, there are different criteria that we have to follow uh, minimum down payment for rental is 20 percent and the maximum refinance is 80 percent so i gave an example of a refinance like your mortgage balance is 400 and your house is worth 600 so that means you have 200 difference right so we can do up to 80 percent of the 200,000 and give that to you as a refinance or as an e-lock or whatever it is you want to use it for when you're buying your rental property a lenders will not allow you to use a down payment to use to use a gift as a down payment but the b lenders will allow it and then most uh most A lenders will allow you to use 50% of your rental income. So a lot of misconception, people think when they have a rental income, I can they are going to use everything to qualify. No, they're only going to use a certain percentage of your rental income. So if you're renting the house out at 2000 you we are only going to be able to use maximum of $1,000 to qualify you for the mortgage. So some will allow a higher amount, but it also depends on the lender, right? Um, but for B lenders, most B lenders will allow you to draw up to 80% of your rental income and use that as a qualifying criteria for you. Uh, another thing that Pegasus also has is you can also decide to be um to be a private lender in the market. So let's say for instance, you you have like 30k, you don't have up to the certain amount of money for down payment, or you have that money. 
and you're not sure of oh, where do I put this, you can also be in the market as a private lender and then you can be lending money to people for for um for financing. And usually they offer right now it's about eleven percent rate of return and usually for one year. So I'll just touch on that briefly. If you if you're looking to be a private lender in in the um for mortgage, you can the minimum you do is twenty five thousand, and then that twenty five thousand you can decide to take your the interest which is eleven percent every month, or you can say okay, pay me back the interest at the end of the year. So at the end of one year, they will pay you back your interest and your principal. So this is also good for people that ask, oh, what kind of investment can I do? Right, this is also a good opportunity. Um, almost done. Uh, just touch base on the rates right now. The rates are really coming down. Uh, if you're looking owner occupied property with less than twenty percent, so owner occupied would mean your primary residence, and you're doing less than twenty percent. This is the rate four point nine four for five years and three years five point two nine. Um. And this is with A lenders. So with B lenders, the interest rate varies. Um, each lender will decide what rate they want to give you when they do the qualification. So for 20% or more, you pay 5.29 and 5.59. Interestingly, you can you realize that people when you pay 20, when you do 20% down payment, less than 20% down payment, you're actually getting low interest. So I had someone point that out like. So why would I do 20% and I'm still getting the higher interest than somebody that paid less than 20%? I'm like, wow, you, know, you can't have it all, right? So um, when you do less than 20% down payments, your mortgage goes through, we call it an insurable mortgage. So that means the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation or Gen Watts, they're going to insure that mortgage, which is to the benefit of the lender. So they are, they are telling the lender that, don't worry, if Dotson defaults, we are going to step in and we are going to pay you your money. So that is the whole idea. So that is the premium you pay when you do less than 20%. So because you are paying that premium, the lender is gonna give you a lower interest rate. But when you do 20% or more, then it is not insured, right? It's a high risk. So we, they also call it a high risk mortgage because the loan to value ratio is 80%. And if anything happens, there is nobody to step in to save the lender. So in order to also cover their own side, your interest rate will be higher. So doing more than 20% doesn't guarantee that you have everything. So people will do the calculation, but I always tell people, you have to put everything, you have to consider everything, right? Before you make that decision. Other rates that we have as of today, variable rates, if you're doing home equity line of credit, the prime rate right now is 7.20, which is crazy. And then the qualifying rate is 5.25. Uh, I think that's it. Any question? I don't know if I was too fast, but that's we, we have some questions in the chat already. Ah, uh, okay. So uh from Clement, he says, What is the equity payment for private lenders? Oh, yeah. So um, I forgot to touch that. When you go through a B lender, right, there are other fees that you pay. So when you go through a B lender, you have to pay, you have to have your down payment, which is 20%. And then you're going to be paying a brokerage fee and a lender fee. The lender fee is usually 1% lender fee. And then your brokerage fee will be, usually my brokerage will charge 1.5%. But sometimes it's negotiable. Right, I can always negotiate uh with the brokerage, but those are the additional fees you pay. With a private mortgage, is also the same thing. So with a private lender, is also the same thing. The private lender will take twenty percent down payment. You pay the lender's fee. You pay your brokerage fee, and then there are other legal fee, admin fee, and all those things. Um, the good thing is sometimes you're able to finance those fees with your mortgage, and what that means is, say, your for instance. You did you 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 want to lend four hundred thousand, and all the other fees is about twenty thousand. So they can now finance four hundred and twenty thousand instead of four hundred thousand, right? So those are the other fees you pay when you use other. If you don't use an A lender, so 
usually the best and the cheapest will be an A lender. No doubt about it. But not everybody will qualify for an A lender for various reasons. Another question is, is the qualification through A, B and private lenders also part of the pre-approval process? Uh, no, so... Okay, so um, for the pre-approval, um, usually I will, um, let me split it. So for some people that wants to go through for new construction, so they will call in, sometimes you hear pre-con, which is pre-construction. Sometimes you hear new construction. Sometimes you hear new build, but the, the common one is pre-con. So if you're going through a pre-construction, usually um, in most cases, maybe they, they've not started building the house or there's a frame in place, but you're gonna be closing in a period of time, say in six months or in one year. For ease of calculation, let me use one year. So you start a pre-con in January and um, it's gonna close in September. Usually for, in here in Ottawa um, that I know of, a lot of builders would ask you for um, for confirmation. I know for Matami, Matami is not really particular about whether it's from a lender or it's a brokerage. Um, Minto would ask, they want a lender's pre-approval. So in that case, you have to submit all the documentation and we have to send it to a lender to approve. So that means you're doing a full approval. If you're doing for Matami, for instance, the pre-approval will just be running the numbers at the brokerage level and seeing what you qualify for. So I'm not going to be asking for statement of down payment. I'm not going to be asking you for all those things. The only thing I'm just concerned about is proof of income, your employment letter, your proof of income, ID, and that's it. And then I run the numbers and I tell you, okay, this is how much you qualify for and do a credit check, right? But when it's but when it's time for a full approval, then you need to get everything into place. Um, so for some lenders like Kaivan, Kaivan will be like they want a lender's approval. So in that case, we have to send it to the lender. So that means you have to submit a full documentation and that is a full approval. The beauty of that is that it's a rate guarantee. So whatever rate Kaivan is giving you is not going to change when it's time to close your house in September. But when it comes, to, if it's a brokerage approval, I don't have a guarantee on the rate. So if the rate goes up at the time of closing, you're going to be subject to the rate at the time of closing. Um, Olabengwe is asking, could you explain the difference between prime rates and interest rates? Oh, okay. Uh, I'll just put this. Prime rate is the one determined by Bank of Canada. So prime rate will be um, the lending rates that uh, Bank of Canada is lending to financial institution. And prime rates affect everything, not just housing. Prime rate is what is applicable on your credit card. It is applicable on your line of credit. It is applicable on all borrowing. Um, interest rate is what the lender is charging you on the product, right? So for instance, you have a credit card of and the interest rate is 22.22%. So that is the interest that the lender is charging. Prime rate is the rate at which Bank of Canada is lending to the financial institution. So one has to do with Bank of Canada, one has to do with the lender, but then one affects the other. So the prime rate would always affect your interest rate. If your prime rate, if the prime rate goes down, then the interest rate also comes down. If the prime rate goes up, then it goes up. That is all. Yes. yes. And then uh, Oludare is saying, please, can you explain more about building equity and buying a second house and how does it work? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if Oludare wants to ask, maybe uh what you by building equity or are you looking at the process of getting a rental property is it in the chat yes the, the question is in the chat no no, no i just like to understand what what he, what what a question is all about maybe where it's coming from 
uh, and Olga is still here. Maybe you can explain. Yes, of course. It's basically like when people say that you build equity when you're making your repayment every month, and then um, you can take from that equity to buy another house. So how does that work out? Oh, okay. Um, this is also a, a very controversial topic, and some people beg to differ. Uh, like I say, like uh, home buying is not is not for everyone. Um, especially with the market, because there are costs that are also attached to it. That you need to understand those costs. That you don't. Um, I mean, it's always a conversation between Shu and I. When you're kind of like, no, when you're renting, you're throwing money away. No, when you're renting, you're not throwing money away. You're paying for a service, right? But that being said, when you buy a house, right? Uh, and um, say, for instance, for ease of calculation, you've borrowed 500000 and your repayment every month is 3000 every month, right? So when you go to your mortgage statement, it will break it down to you how much goes to the principal and how much goes to the interest. Right, so let's say out of the three thousand twenty five hundred. Oh, that's not correct. For ease of calculation, two thousand goes to your principal, and then you pay one thousand as interest. So you know that um, the two thousand that goes into your principal. So if you multiply the two thousand times twelve, that's twenty four thousand. That means at the end of the year, you would have paid twenty four thousand out of the five hundred thousand. Is that making sense? So that means in twenty twenty four. You would have paid twenty four thousand out of five hundred thousand. So when you're starting the following year, your balance is reducing. And the beauty of real estate, however, where the equity comes in is that it's it's appreciates, right? So let's say the following year, twenty twenty five, your balance is now for four seventy five, right? And then by spring of next year, your house is now worth six hundred thousand. I don't know if I can use, if I can add a note to make sense, to make it make sense. How do I use notes here? And also, sorry, I feel like writing. So if you, so it would make you sense can, if I can use notes. You can click on, let me say all participants. Now you can click on a whiteboard. Yeah, I can say whiteboard. Anyway. Oh, I can't see, but anyways, um, maybe I should stop sharing. Okay, so um, hold on. Okay, yeah, I can see it now. But then I still have to share. Okay, anyways, so so um, so let's say at the beginning of twenty twenty five, your balance is now four seventy five. But then when you go into the market, your house is now worth 675, right? So that means if you take six, 475 from 675, you have 200,000, right, on the house. That 200,000, that is the equity that you've built on that house. I don't know if that makes sense. That's a simple logic to equity. So equity would be take, check out what is my house worth, less my mortgage balance. Whatever difference you have, that is the equity you've built on that house. Now, um, you cannot take out the equity to do different things. You can take it to even run your lifestyle, take it to travel, to Bahamas, whatever it is you want to use it for. So two different ways. You can do a refinance or you can do equity takeout. So or you can take it out as an home equity line of credit. So for instance, remember we have 200000 a lot of lenders would allow you to do up to 80% of that difference, right? So, okay. So when you take 80% of the difference, yeah, it's not allowing me to do it. Okay, maybe I'll. Yeah, we can see the- uh, You can see the, the whiteboard board now. now, right? Yes, yes. And I, just, not, I don't know where to, I don't know. I'm not Gen Z, so anyway. <laughs> Uh, so when you, so I just wanted to illustrate just to write. So when you take 80% of the 200, that is your, that amount that you have, you are available to take that amount for whatever thing you want to use it for. So you can use that 80% of the 200, you can use it to buy a new house. So they can put it into your account as, um, 
as a deposit. So they can deposit that into your account. You can use that to buy a second house. You can use it to set up a line of credit, which is usually cheaper. So sometimes using it to set up an home equity line of credit is cheaper than you just collecting it. as You can use that to set up a second mortgage, you know, so you can use it for a lot of things. But in the old essence is, for, if, I, if you want to understand, have I, how much equity have I built on my houses? Take your mortgage balance and take how much your house is worth, less your mortgage balance. That would give you how much you have in equity and what you can do with it. Thank you very much. Say that uh, we are we have used up all our time. It's already yeah. eleven thirty three, and like I said, um, uh, Say that please share your your contact information in the chat yes. also. Sure. Uh, so if you have any questions regarding any of um, Say that's presentation, you can reach out directly to her. And then book a session, she would uh, always make time available. And also, for those of us who missed uh, the presentation, my own presentation, we are recording this session. Uh, it will be uploaded. Uh, and then once it's uploaded, the link will be made available. So you can always go and rewatch uh, the, the videos. And also, you can uh, contact. You can look in the chat now. You can reach out and contact um, um, myself and say that also if yeah. you have any questions regarding any of the things we have discussed yeah. today. So I want to say thank you very much to everyone for your time. Thank you for joining this very first session. Uh, we will plan a second session in earnest, find a topic that most affects um, uh new immigrants, uh, those living in Canada, uh, just find an expert to come and give uh, vital information on such topics so that we can all learn and also, you know, have access to these important information as quickly as possible in our journey to ensuring that we thrive in Canada. So thank you very much. This forms the end yeah. of so please, next one, can we bring a tax consultant? I, I think that's also one area that it's a great area for a lot of people, right? Even people, for me, yes. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll, please look out on my social media. We will have polls available. Also, you can send us suggestions on topics yeah. that uh, you want to learn more about, right? So we can pick from there and find an expert in that field. And then, uh, and then uh, 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 create another session for everyone to participate. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, no menu menu. So that's how we'll be going. Though, <laughs> There's many menu, menu in each person's house. That's why it's uh, online. <laughs> How do I stop this recording? Uh, I will stop it. Okay. <laughs>